and uh, this leads just so naturally into uh, the topic for tonight's talk, which I wanted to begin with this quote from um, somebody that Shelley and I have studied with, Saida Utejaniya, this Burmese teacher, Buddhist monk, really powerful teacher. And Ilsa had put some of his books, uh, for those of you who are at the retreat center, under the Kuan Yin statue. And those of you who are at home, of course, can, uh, most of his books are available for free digital copies online at saidautejaniya.org. But this is a, I just find this a very powerful little teaching he wrote or said, we need to thoroughly understand how much the three unskillful roots, the three unskillful root qualities of mind are torturing and tormenting us. So the three unwholesome root qualities of greed, of fear and aversion, and of delusion, being disconnected, not in align with the way it is, are torturing and tormenting us. We haven't learned this lesson fully yet. We don't learn our lesson the first time, the second time, or the third time. We'll only turn for help from wholesome qualities when we realize the unskillful qualities are running our lives and we can no longer stand it. <laughs> and this is, you know, how many times have we been burnt by life? By not so much by life or by experience, but by, as Shelley was talking about the other night, by the way the heart was relating to experience. How many times have we been fried, been burnt, been oppressed, been burdened and weighed down by the way my heart, this heart is in the habit of relating to experience and not just painful experience. We can be quite burdened by relating to pleasant experience with attachment just as much as relating to unpleasant experience with aversion. And another quote from Sayada, it is very important to keep trying to maintain the intention to remain aware all the time. Whether awareness is actually continuous or not, this points to the essential quality of right effort, persistence. It is not a forceful effort, but rather an inner determination to sustain the tiny bit of energy you need in each moment to know you are aware and to keep that going. Like how much effort does it take right now just to know each of us, just to know that it's like this now. Sitting is like this feeling the body, the breathing body. It's like this, noticing the sensitive heart, the feeling heart is like this, the qualities here in the heart, tight or open, bored or interested, quality of the mind, the quality of the air touching the skin. And really it isn't so much that right now we're, and please just do this reflection with me as I speak. Isn't it true that right now we don't, in any way, we don't have to make this heart sensitive. Really what we're doing as a practitioner is we're noticing that the mind, the heart is sensitive already right now. This heart is sensitive. And the interesting question right now is when we're aware of the sensitivity, or you could even say the exposure to the moment, exposure to the way that it is, is it safe to relax right now a little bit more? Is it safe to soften? Is it safe? Is it okay to feel what's here to feel, to sense what's here to experience? 
Is it safe? Is it wholesome to come into alignment or to come into intimacy with what's moving now in the moment? And is it possible to be kind, tender, and caring? Does that help? Is it possible and does it help to be kind now with the way it is, with the experience we're experiencing? Is kindness actually available now? And continuing whatever kindness is possible. Is it possible also to be interested, to be humble and curious about all that's in motion in my heart, in my body, around me, in me? Like a fresh, open mind, that seeing things with new eyes is feeling in a new way. Oh yeah, this is how it is. And is it possible now for me to sustain this kind and alive presence, interest? And whatever is in the way of sustaining this continuity of present moment awareness, can I be aware of whatever seems to be in the way, whatever hooks and bait and off ramps, distractions there might be? Can I just include all that as part of what's moving, part of the exposure to the present moment? And really, again, sense how much effort does it take right now to connect and sustain this interest in the present moment? Keeping the present moment in mind, how much effort does that take? Can I sustain it for a few more moments? Could I, can I sustain it the rest of this life or forever? Is the heart in some way nourished because of this intimacy? Is there something good or right or healing when there is this sustaining present moment awareness, just sense. Even some kind of inner joy. And we might even feel flavors of gratitude for the path and our teachers and our own intuition that got us here, keeps us with the practice. For all the causes and conditions that has, have led to this, place where we have this deep, heartfelt connection with the path. And I wanted to talk, you can feel free to adjust from your meditative pose if you'd like. I wanted to start with uh, a simile that's been used. Ajahn Sushito uses it and Carol Wilson. And many people have used this simile 
of our ordinary worldly existence as a kind of being in prison, like samsara. Some of you, most of you maybe know that word samsara, the cycles, repeating cycles of suffering, our ignorance, our <clears throat> reactive self-centered patterns, begetting more ignorance, more self-centered patterns, more stress, begetting more and more the same. And I uh, remember Carol Wilson, one of the IMS teachers, a colleague of mine, but also has been a teacher of mine, especially in the early years. And uh, I remember, it's, I think it was an article Carol wrote, just talked about a really wonderful definition of samsara is we're in prison in our little nine by nine, sterile, unsatisfying room. And we think we have a solution which is to rearrange the furniture. And that's what we do day after day, year after year, decade after decade. We're in prison, oppressed, weighed down by the limitations of being in that small cell. And we still somehow think that if I could just get this furniture arranged right, I'm gonna be happy. I'm gonna be satisfied. I'll be okay, right? So. It's a little bleak, but it's, it's good because it can, it can kind of shine a new light on some of our habits that we, you know, the habits we keep chasing or the, the patterns, the sense experiences we keep chasing, thinking it's really going to do the trick. Let me try that again. <laughs> Let me try ice cream one more time. Kind of works. Seems like it's going to work. And then uh, another simile related, you know, the same prison simile, you know, we, at some point, we kind of get the limitations and the unsatisfactoriness of re rearranging the furniture. Like, I don't think this is going anywhere. Been there, done this. Is there another way? And maybe we get some teachings or maybe we just stumble upon it, but we, you know, we start shaking the bars and scratching at the walls and looking for like, is this all there is, you know? And maybe if we get the right kind of instructions or supports, we persist in one place, some place where the, the cement of the wall is a little weak. And we just persist in like really looking, really scratching and really working at one weak point. And in that initial work, because we're just, you know, even when we get a quarter inch of the concrete off, we still are just experiencing concrete, you know, nothing's really changed. So initially, we, the only faith we have is that rearranging the furniture isn't going to do it. And we might have some borrowed faith that scratching on the concrete wall is beneficial. <laughs> Sound like practice sometimes? Like we're sitting and the mind wanders and we bring it back and the mind wanders and we bring it back and the mind wanders and we bring it back and the mind wanders and we bring it back and the mind wanders and it can be a long time before we even know that it's wandered and that we can reestablish some semblance of a composed, relaxed, clear, present moment awareness. But we persist. And if we persist long enough, there's going to be a little hole all the way through that wall and some light from outside is going to shine in. We still don't know what the outside's about because it's just a little hole. This is uh, me paraphrasing the simile that um, I think it's in one of, it might be in Ajahn Sushito's book. Um, he has a book that's sort of a manual of insight meditation practice. Uh, and I think this is, a simile in that book. And that's, we can just sort of reflect on the kind of faith or confidence that arises. We don't know what it is, but we know there's something outside the cell because we've gotten through the concrete, took a long time. There's some kind of light. There's something different out there than is in here. And that's all we know. But that's more than so now we know two things. Rearranging the furniture didn't lead anywhere. 
we have direct experiential understanding. That's not how, and we all, I think all of us are in that place to some degree, certainly with some of our habits. This habit, I, I may not be free of the habit. I still may do that dance, that addictive dance, but I'm rarely thinking it's gonna lead anywhere. Still got a lot of momentum. I don't believe in it anymore. And then, you know, we persist with our practice with borrowed faith that maybe something good will come from it. I'm going to develop mindfulness. I'm going to come back to the present moment. Gets boring, doesn't seem to matter, but we persist, we persist. And eventually we start seeing some light, at least moments, something that we haven't seen before. That's the telltale, that's the light. We see something about the present moment, about the nature of the mind, the heart, that we hadn't seen before. It might be the light might have the flavor of like a joy for no good reason. Not joy because I got ice cream, but joy that's just there in the moment for no good reason or lightness or release, the release of what the heart was holding. Something goes away. We don't understand why a moment ago I felt burdened or bound up and now that bound upness isn't there. So of course, now we have the second aspect of faith, direct. There's something, I don't know what it is. There's something and it's related. What seemed to be supportive is persistence. And this is a, not a small part of the path. This Shelley talked about this the first night um, that they spoke. Apamada, you know, sometimes we use the word virya, which uh, gets translated as energy or effort, but there's a related word apamada that usually gets translated as vigilance, zeal, um, diligence, and persistence. And <laughs> this is, uh, as I was saying, no small teaching because, you know, at the end of the Buddhist life, right before he passed on, died, this is what he chose to say. Everything is ephemeral. Everything comes and goes. Do your practice with vigilance. Check it out and commit. Be wholehearted. There is a way. If there wasn't a way, I wouldn't tell you there's a way. There is a way. Don't give up. All right. One expression of this that I love from a, a Coleman Barks translated one of, or I don't know, it's a light translation or a creative translation of one of Rumi's poems, this wonderful Persian Sufi uh, Muslim poet from the 13th century or thereabouts. And a line in one of the poems that Coleman Barks uh, freely translated as don't go back to sleep don't go back to sleep and that's really what we we need to be careful about it's just so easy to go back to autopilot where we're just living out the habit energies of our personality of our mind that have the most momentum and we just it and it, it's so tragic and heartbreaking that seemingly the easy way is the way of suffering. Not because it isn't suffering, but because it has momentum. It's well greased that we can continue living in stressful ways forever, simply because we've been living in stressful ways forever. Because normally, like when we add mindful awareness to the mix, we cultivate that stability of present moment awareness, we won't keep doing what's stressful. But when, we're, when the awareness is superficial and distracted and when we're unconscious or not aware, not mindfully aware, we can keep doing stressful things forever. So, you know, just to finish up the simile from about the prison cell, you know, and then with that added confidence, we 
we keep working that same hole and the hole gets bigger and bigger. And at some point we can get our head right out that hole and we look around. And then at that point, our confidence is unshakable. It doesn't matter. Before we just had a, some intuition, some direct experience that it's something. Now we've gotten our head out and we really get a taste of that freedom, that release. And I often say just from my own experience, and I think it seems to correspond with others, just the insights or the getting your head out of the hole experiences, that the aftertaste is some unshakable sense that as messy as life is, as broken as everything is, as real as suffering is, the aftertaste of these insights is, it's okay. This world has broken as terrible as it is. It's okay. Does it mean that a lot of it's easy to get confused by that? Like, oh, so, you know, we don't have to do anything because it's okay. It just means it's okay. The heart doesn't, because everything is the way that it is, doesn't mean we have to carry three tons on our back. We can be free and care about the suffering in the world. We don't have to, whether we're wealthy and privileged and don't want to share because there's so much need, I'm just going to ride it out with as much comfort as I can manage, or we really lean in. The point is, suffering is optional regardless of the conditions. That's the insight. You don't have to believe it. It doesn't help actually to believe that that's true. What helps is, you know, are you getting to the place where rearranging the furniture <laughs> doesn't seem to help? You know, are you willing, you know, or have you been humbled by your attempts to be happy so that you're willing to listen to somebody who seems to have some confidence like the Buddha and the Buddhist teachings? You know, because it's pretty provocative when somebody says there is an end to suffering, given the facts on the ground, like how much suffering there is. That's a provocative statement. It's very appropriate for us. We should be skeptical. But because we don't know anything better, we listen. And we've learned that our strategies haven't really helped. So we listen at some point and we check it out. And if we have supporting enough conditions, we start seeing something we hadn't seen before. And we start, it's just a basic cause and effect. We connect the efforts we've made in our practice with the seeing something we hadn't seen before. And again, it may not even be that we fully understand what we're seeing. We just know it's new. <laughs> it's new information and it changes like the new information is sort of out of the box. And it actually initially makes us more humble because it doesn't give us great clarity. It just makes us much more respectful that this life shouldn't be just rearranging the furniture. I'm going to go for it. Because initially when we're just scratching at the concrete wall, we can have real doubt, like what's the point of going in another Buddhist retreat or doing another sit, or doing another walking period, or listening to another talk. I mean, my God, how many talks? <laughs> it, it's actually funny when I think of, you know, you know, just having been in the thick of it for so long. It's like, but it's like, this is the thing about the taste of freedom. It's like, I... I don't know much, but one thing I know is that the experience, my experience of suffering, my experience of oppression, my experience of being weighted down by life, the confidence I have now is that's not the whole picture. So whenever, very quickly nowadays, when I'm suffering, the perception, the understanding, this isn't the whole picture is there. There's something else 
here and now that's not being seen. I'm in the pr prison cell. The deep habits of wanting to rearrange the furniture so I feel better kick in and wisdom kicks in too. The new, the new kid on the block, wisdom kicks in. Well, wait a minute. There's something that's here and now that's not being seen. And because we've, you know, done the work of scr scratching and we kind of know where the holes are. We know what, where to knock, where to scratch. And we know what it's like to try too hard to be in a rush and how that doesn't work. And we know what it's like to be complacent. Like, I know that hole's there, so why bother to look? No, we have to, it's like wisdom doesn't work that way because we had that insight once it doesn't really help us right now. The only thing that helps us right now is the confidence that whatever confidence from that previous insight inspires the heart to look again, now, here and now. Renew the insight here and now. Oh, oh, this is how it is. This is just something being known. This is just this. And the structures of suffering melt away. And the flavor of liberation, it's okay. It's okay to be a broken, confused, neurotic human being in a broken, neurotic world with broken and neurotic relationships with each other. Some freedom shines through. And the simile continues, you know, eventually the hole's big enough, you can get out and walk around. But strangely, you know, the remaining neurotic habits is we still want to go back to the prison to sleep at night. <laughs> you know, it's like we have moments, times when, you know, there's real freedom and we might navigate a whole part of a day with very little greed, hatred and delusion. And then for some just causes and conditions, the mind still finds that little box of greed, hatred, and delusion comforting because it's so well known. It's so familiar. I'll just go back to my neurotic little cabin, <laughs> my little prison cell. And I know I've got my freedom, but I'm still attached to the limitations of self, selfing, egoic life. So the Buddha's path, you know, is really a path of wisdom. The Buddha assessed his own situation and saw that, you know, it's the not understanding the experience of suffering that is the cause for suffering. So using the simile, it's the not recognizing that our strategies to be happy are stressful that is the cause for suffering. So we just keep rearranging the furniture, keep looking for sense experience to provide some meaning, some lasting resonant meaning and hope and satisfaction. And when we have bad, difficult circumstances, we imagine those people who have better circumstances, like, oh, if I had their life, if I had their body, if I had their money, if I had their nice situation, if people treated me like them, then I'd be happy. It's always good to kind of bring in this caveat because you know, a lot of people who have difficulty in life, who have been mistreated in any number of ways, they are working really hard to have better conditions. And the Buddhist path is not in any way, you know, some scolding like, oh, you idiot, you know, what are you doing working for civil rights? Or what are you doing working for econ economic justice? Or what are you doing working for climate justice? You know, you should just be doing your Dharma practice.
But one thing that happens when we do, you know, probably any number of us in this group at the retreat center or online here, you know, we've really worked at making our family life healthier, or we've really worked with our partner and the relationship we have with our partner or our good friends, or we really worked in our local community or in this community or that community. And things get better, things get worse. There are so many forces at play. And to the degree that our work to make things better is um, inspired by the idea that when we're done and things are better, then I can relax. That's a setup for betrayal. We have to be in the work because the work is good to do, because it's enlivening, because it's a way of actually scratching on the concrete wall. And this is, uh, this is not so easy and it's confusing because so much of what we identify with the Buddhist path is silent meditation and living a quiet, secluded life. <clears throat> Excuse me. But there's a whole nother part of the practice, which is being a morally sensitive human being and responding to that sensitivity that we feel. Because that's just another way, a very effective way to scratch. Because when I'm caring about the suffering of others and my own suffering and, and really leaning in, saying what needs to be said, doing what needs to be done. I'm going against the grain of fear, going against the grain of self-centeredness, realizing, you know, that nobody's really free unless we're taking care of everybody. How can we really relax and be comfortable <coughs> when beings are being mistreated? <coughs> well, we can only be comfortable when beings are being mistreated when we're deluded. And delusion is stressful. Having to remain disconnected from the way it is, is stressful. So the way to think about that is, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is that we, we really have these two pistons of practice. And if you like that engine metaphor, you know, we have this sort of work of the meditative work of seclusion and quiet and basically whatever sensitizes the heart. And then we have the exposure part of practice where we, we embrace the exposure. And the exposure is that moral sensitivity. We care. The heart quivers because what moral sensitivity is, is that recognition that your life is not different than my life. Your suffering is not different than my suffering. So when I sense someone, someone's happiness or someone's suffering, there is a sympathetic resonance with their happiness or their suffering. And in the same way that I would appreciate my own well-being and happiness, I'll appreciate the happiness and well-being of another. And in the way that my own suffering, my own pain, would cause this heart to quiver. Your suffering, your pain causes this heart to quiver. And, we, and the, naturally the heart wants to alleviate the suffering when we're sensitive, when we're awake. You see, and so that's the engine where <clears throat> the meditative side of the practice makes us sensitive. I mean, it's healing to have a deep, quiet set, to, have a beautiful long meditation retreat and access more refined states of heart and mind and really learn about some of the more still, silent, peaceful states of meditation. But the, the more interesting work is when we come back into the world and we have to earn a living 
or we have to deal with our sexual inclinations. We have to have an honest relationship with sexuality, an honest relationship with how power is moving around us and our own desire for power and voice and significance. We can't deny that those impulses are there. And yet, in some ways, we feel like we're in competition with other people who have you know, inclinations for power and significance and voice. And how are we going to do this together? And that's where that's the whole realm of moral sensitivity. And now on top of it, we have all this greater sensitivity from our meditative work. We just feel everything so much more. Our own pain, our own confusion, our own greed, hatred, and delusion. And we sense it in others, the same stuff in others, all those around us swimming in greed, hatred, and delusion. And the thing about that exposure that sensitivity brings is that only wisdom allows us to survive the sensitivity. So the whole meditative process is to make us so sensitive that we can't stand being a human being unless wisdom grows. It's the only thing that makes sensitivity tolerable. And as hard as it is to be sensitive, it never really makes sense to go back to numbness and distraction and delusion. I mean, we do because of habits, but we don't consciously choose to be disconnected. Like with a clear, balanced mind, no clear, balanced mind says, you know what? I'm just going to disconnect. We might turn away from pain, but we would choose, wisdom would choose to be intimate somewhere else. Because intimacy is really synonymous with being alive. Nobody chooses to be dead like that famous sutta. I actually made a copy of it so that I don't have to paraphrase. Let's see if I can put my hands on it. Here it is. It's the second chapter in this collection of Buddhist verses called the Dhammapada, the path of Dhamma. And chapter two is vigilance. That's that word apamada that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and this is Gil Fransdahl's translation of the Dhammapada. Vigilance is the path to the deathless, to awakening. Negligence is the path to death. The vigilant do not die. The negligent are as if already dead. That's, that's such a powerful little teaching. The negligent, when we're not persistent, when we have no interest in being present, we don't really have a life in the real sense of the world. world word. We're just dead in our habit energies, in our autopilot habit energies, oblivious seems like a life until we're alive. And of course, initially when we're alive, when we're sensitive, it's like, there is like, do I really want to be sensitive? Because wisdom hasn't caught up to the sensitivity. But we really don't want to go back to being dead, to being on autopilot. But we don't really yet know how to tolerate the sensitivity how much sensitive to the beauty, the very real beauty, and sensitive to the horror and the suffering. Simple things. I'm not even talking about, you know, just the ancient habits of hating and mistreating others, but just a bird flying into a, a window and how the, something or an earthworm that because of the rain got out of the ground and ended up on the sidewalk and then the sun comes out and there it is, or especially if there's gravel, you know, and trapped, drying out or vulnerable to the birds. And, you know, it's not, it's just what life is. It just breaks our heart continuously. Or we get a package from Amazon and we just realize how much waste, you know, in the plastic and the packaging and the, <laughs> this and the that. And it just breaks our heart in a good way. We just, we need to realize that our heartbreaking open 
is in the right direction. Thinking that it's too much is ignorant, is ignorance. It does feel like it's too much, but we want to keep an open mind. It feels like it's too much, but maybe it's not too much. I don't really know if it's too much. I just know it's intense and that it feels like this. It feels like I can't handle it, but I don't really know. Let's see. I'll just try around the edges to relax a little. Or maybe I'll do a touch and go. I'll open and then I'll turn my attention away from it. And then I'll come back and I'll just touch it for a moment, open to it, the pain for a moment, acknowledge it. Honey, I know you're there. This uncertainty, this fear, this whatever. I know you're there. And now I'm going to take a walk or now I'm going to make a cup of tea or now I'm going to walk back and forth and feel my feet on the earth. Part of this uh, deepening insight, you know, seeing the cracks, seeing the little light, seeing something we haven't seen before and and the deepening of that and a more clarity about what the path is. It's like it wears out the habits in our mind. That's a really useful way to think about it. We're wearing out wrong view. And what's left is wise view. And what is wrong view? That there's something permanent, that there's some fixed self that can be satisfied that there's beauty and ugliness, that there's real satisfaction from grasping, from having, from possession. So these, you know, these are deeply rooted. We really like seeing things in that dualistic way, beautiful and ugly. And it's, you know, it's okay to have preferences. I like this. I don't like that. We don't have to pretend we don't have preferences of what we like and don't like. But that's all it is. It's something that we're conditioned to like and something we're conditioned to not like. But in, in a deeper dharmic sense, it's not beautiful or ugly. Things are just what they are. And it's useful like those things that repulse us to stay with them for a while until we realize it's neither ugly nor beautiful. It's just what it is. And when we are around something that's really beautiful, like a sunset on a beautiful day, you know, and initially because of the way the mind's conditioned, it's like so beautiful. It just, you know, takes the breath away. But to not assume that that's the final understanding and just stay with it it's this being known be really really intimate really relaxed really open to the truth until the beautiful night the beautiful sunset the beautiful breeze we were at uh, i was at prairie farm for the first half of the retreat as you know and every night about this time and even a little bit earlier the owls you can hear the owls making their amazing sounds out there and uh, so you hear those sort of things or you see the red fox or I, I, one night, just a few nights ago, I think I saw 16 deer within about a 20 minute period, just moving through our field right outside the south side of the building, just kind of moseying across the field three or four at a time. And those things, you know, we, it's almost like we're, um, like a self-stimulation, the perception of beauty and the liking of beauty and the perception. And we're trying to feed on the beauty of nature, for example. But if we just keep practicing, eventually it's beautiful, but it's just what it is. So it's not like not beautiful, but there's something that's more true than that dualistic notion that it's beautiful. And, you know, words don't really capture it, but there's something sublimely peaceful when the mind moves beyond its likes and dislikes. 
And this is the flavor, you know, for those who have done some concentration practice or heard about the fourth jhana, the real, the sort of deepest meditative state, concentration state, it's really the experience of the mind that is so sublime, so peaceful, that it's withdrawn from those habits of likes and dislikes, from good and bad and beautiful and ugly. And it really gives us a flavor of the liberation, like the flavor of it's okay. But it means leaving behind the, the dualistic world. And we get a sense of that, right? Oh, we, we certainly know those moments in our life where the dualistic, like what's good and what's bad is like, the mind is riveted to its opinion about what's good and bad. And it's, like all in to argue or to fight for what's good and to avoid what's bad. And uh, it's like survival, like death is bad and not being killed is good. And I'm all in, right? So that's, that's part of our animal existence is we'll be drawn back into that world. But this animal world of, by animal, I mean just like the deep instinct to want to survive that can be informed by this other understanding that it's okay. It's okay to be an animal who wants to survive and wants to protect my own. And I can understand that's just what that is. I can have a peaceful relationship even when that survival instinct gets triggered. So I don't have to like, oh no, I'm a Buddhist. I can't have a survival instinct anymore. You know, when somebody does something to me, I can't flinch because I'm a Buddhist and Buddhists don't flinch. You know, they're peaceful and equanimous and they don't react. <laughs> but really it's the non-reaction is not having a reaction about being triggered, you know, and then this arises, okay. Sometimes there's enough stability and clarity and the mind doesn't outwardly react and sometimes the fly lands in the skin and you just swat it and but there can be even wisdom there that oh yeah sometimes it's like that i was aggressive i was acting in a violent way feels like this looks like this the remorse is like this non-judgment no judgment needed causes and conditions And it's okay, as I mentioned before, you know, we don't have a perfect picture of what this is, this like crawling out of the prison. It's, it's really okay to be honest with ourselves. Like we don't really know what the path is about. We have a lot of confidence that rearranging the furniture hasn't led to a profound satisfaction, hasn't really led to a trustworthy refuge. We've had our, you know, each of us in our own particular way, our intuitions, our little cracks of light or seeing something new. And we've made the correlation between our practice and the waking up, seeing something new, seeing something beyond our cycles of suffering that's compelling in the heart, that's energizing of the heart, that keeps us signing up you know, for another retreat or sitting in the morning or hanging out with our Dharma friends or listening to people who seem to know something about the path and sticking with it. So I'll just end with this quote. Uh, I find this very moving from the Buddha, really talking about leaving the prison cell. So this is somebody talking to the Buddha, asking for some support. Sir, there are people stuck midstream in the terror and the fear, the flood of great danger, of the rush of the river of being, right? becoming, being caught up in our self-centeredness, and death 
and decay, overwhelm them. For their sake, sir, tell me where to find an island. Tell me where to find solid ground beyond the reach of all this pain. And the Buddha responded, for the sake of those people stuck in the middle of the river of being, flooded by the river of being, overwhelmed by death and decay, that's us. <laughs> I will tell you where to find solid ground. That's great. I told you it's provocative. Someone's actually giving us an answer. And again, the answer is just, uh, it's like uh, some kind of beacon, even if only in an intellectual or symbolic way initially. But in what, some way, it probably aligns with some intuition, some experience. So the Buddha says, I will tell you where to find solid ground. There is an island, an island which you cannot go beyond. It is the place of no thingness, nothingness, a place of non-possession and non-attachment. It is the total end of death and decay, insecurity and loss. And this is why I call it Nibbana, the extinguished, the cool, unbinding. There are people who in mindfulness have realized this and are completely cooled here and now. They do not become slaves working for Mara, for death. They cannot fall into his power, the kind of neurotic powers of greed, hatred, and delusion, because they've uprooted that habit of falling back under the sway of those habits. So let's let go of the words. Just sit together for 30 seconds or so. So we have some time for <clears throat> walking and movement and I won't be joining the evening sit tonight. So I'll see you in the morning for the morning sit. Um, but uh, just encouragement, you know, we've built up the momentum during these days that you may think you don't have momentum, but that's because we're sensitive. And part of being sensitive means we're sensitive to the neurotic mind, but it doesn't mean you don't have momentum. So just with, with the energy that you have in a way that feels skillful, just use the time this evening as late as you have energy. Get up when you feel like you've gotten enough sleep and continue the practice, really using all the remaining hours of our retreat together. So I'll see you in the morning, everyone. <clears throat>